start where it's more most popular. I mean, a, a lot of people yeah. think about creatine. Yeah, like it's really evolved over the last 40 years. It's gone from athletes getting bigger, stronger, faster. And now we're looking at potential benefits on bone health, uh, brain health, cardiovascular health, um, even in children and during pregnancy. So it's evolved from just the young male athlete to pretty much anybody on the planet is now considering creatine either in their diet or supplementation. So uh, for the next few hours, super excited to talk about all aspects of creatine and the evidence-based research behind it. Why is it so popular? Well, it, because it works from a, a muscle performance perspective. So it really, it basically increases the ability to produce ATP or maintain it during uh, an exercise session. So for example, when you're doing, you know, uh, a squat or leg press or even running, you're doing muscle contractions and phosphocreatine, which is what we're going to be talking about today from creatine supplementation. It really maintains ATP or adenosine di, uh, triphosphate. So if you have more ATP longer, you can exercise at a higher capacity, a higher intensity. And that delays the utilization of other energy systems that might be a bit slower. Um, so anybody involved in high explosive anaerobic type of sports, weightlifting, high intensity interval training, for example, um, probably would experience some benefits from creatine supplementation. So it definitely seems to increase training volume. So that's either the load by the reps by the set or exercise capacity from a cardiovascular perspective. Um, it definitely, if you were to choose one thing why creatine has been so effective, it's improving muscle strength. Um, you could also encompass that with endurance and power. It also improves lean body mass. So here's a big dis uh, discrepancy that a lot of the viewers might not know. When we measure lean body mass in the labs, we're, we're technically measuring blood, connective tissue, soft tissue. Um, so we're not directly measuring muscle mass. We need to do a lot more research on that. Um, but in general, about 50% of the value of lean body mass, we consider muscle. So it has some small favorable effects. There's been some studies with uh, QCT as well as uh, ultrasound. But you can get an increase in lean body mass, regional muscle thickness, uh, muscle performance. But probably the area that most people don't realize is the recovery aspects. It really seems to have some anti-catabolic effects, um, potentially anti-inflammatory uh, effects. And that's interesting because it's from the aerobic community. For the longest time, we never thought creatine was for endurance or aerobic type athletes. And the best lines of evidence from a recovery aspect uh, come from long duration aerobic exercise, a marathon, ultra marathon, a triathlon. It seems to reduce cytokines. So those are markers of inflammation. Um, so there's a whole gamut of mechanisms. There's about 10 what we consider anabolic uh, factors. And then there's probably just as many as an anti-catabolic uh, effect. Is creatine benefiting? benefiting th is that how it's benefiting increasing the training volume? Yeah, in two ways. So it really seems to um, maximize either the recruitment or the ability of type 2 muscle fibers. Uh, and when we talk about aging, unfortunately, those are the ones we're losing as we get older. But it really seems to work in the second, third, and fourth set. So for example, if you were to do four sets of leg press, Compared to placebo, you may not notice any difference in the first set because we think we have enough ATP or fossil creatine stores in our muscle. But when it comes to set two, three, and four, that's where creatine really comes to the rescue. The individual or group can do more uh, repetitions, and then over time, they can actually do a greater volume. We think with weeks of training, if you're doing more volume, you can actually get greater physiological adaptations. So when we look at all the meta-analysis, when you compare creatine and weight training to creatine, placebo and weight training, there is a greater increase in lean body mass, uh, muscle size, as well as muscle performance. So creatine, there is something there from a mechanistic standpoint to allow that. Uh, and we think muscle fiber uh, recruitment, primarily type 2 muscle fibers, is one of the main reasons. On average, if you were to totally wipe out your normal creatine stores, it takes about three to five minutes for your mitochondria to recover that. Uh, however, creatine really, really speeds up that recovery, which is great for the average person. They don't have a lot of time to work out. They can't wait around for three to five minutes in between a really intense set. So it really speeds up the recovery. Not only does it speed up the recovery after every set, but in between contractions as well. So over time, the individual could probably have a really intense, great workout in less time total and get actually more favorable effects. Now creatine has been 
touted as a new neurotransmitter. So this is quite interesting. It actually seems to release a lot of things from a neuromuscular uh, uh, perspective. But the biggest thing is the ability to recruit not only type 1, but these type 2 muscle fibers as well. Um, and then, of course, if we're having greater muscle or motor unit recruitment, we can potentially lift longer, heavier, and and, and over time get uh, uh, sort of more uh, an increase in strength. The other big thing from a cellular perspective is that creatine causes calcium to come back in a little vesicle in our muscles. If you take in high school biology or university, uh, this will be your nightmare. But I remember everybody talking about the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's an area that just releases calcium to allow our muscles to contract. And, and creatine speeds up the uptake of calcium. So some of the evidence out of Europe has shown that it increases relaxation time or the ability of the, the proteins in your muscle to grab hold of each other to contract. So there's a cellular aspect there explaining why we think we get an increase in muscle performance. I say strength, but endurance and power are all lumped in there as well. So endurance is the ability to perform repetitions to fatigue or power, move an object as fast as you can. They're all vitally important. But we think strength is overall, from a global perspective, uh, number one. It's probably the main reason a lot of older adults are placed in long-term care facilities. If they have a reduction in strength, they can't live independently. So that's why, again, resistance training or weight-bearing exercise, as you mentioned, CrossFit, whichever it is, foundational. I'm from Canada, so shoveling the driveway in the winter counts because anything that's a load against you is is really beneficial to the body. I think people underestimate the benefits of moving. Um, and then if anything can be taken in in this form, creatine, it'd be very, very uh, beneficial. First off, creatine doesn't directly increase protein synthesis, which might be a surprise for a lot of reviewers. It sort of works in, in a magical other way, which we can talk about. But from a, a muscle breakdown perspective, it seems to reduce something called leucine oxidation, primarily in young males. And that's an indicator of whole body uh, breakdown. We've also shown in our lab it reduces uh, 3-methylhistamine, which is another indicator of whole body breakdown. But nothing is directly shown in the muscle itself. Uh, and for some reason, females don't experience this. We've looked at it in young and older females. We don't see the same effect. The only logical explanation is it could have something to do with progesterone or estrogen. We just don't know that. Um, and from an anti-catabolic effect, uh, decreasing some of these tissue uh, repair mechanisms, there's not a lot of research out there. But unfortunately, we're not seeing any evidence that creatine increases protein synthesis. So unlike protein, which it does, creatine seems to help increase muscle size in other ways, uh, satellite cells, growth factors, things like that. But it does decrease protein breakdown, primarily though in males. Uh, and we still don't know exactly why, but we think estrogen or the other sex hormones might be involved. Does creatine have a general anti-inflammatory effect in, in both uh, males and females? It does in young and older individuals. But here's an important distinction. The more stressed the body is, it seems to come to the rescue more. So if you're a young individual, adequate sleep, proper nutrition, you're probably not going to notice any anti-inflammatory effects. It's when the body is under times of tr uh, extensive exercise or trauma, hypoxia. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about the brain and sleep deprivation. So whenever the body is more stressed or under more attack, that's when creatine seems to come to the rescue. So we naturally are producing creatine creatine in two main areas, in the liver and in the brain. And on average, we're producing uh, about one to two grams. Then we're also consuming in the diet anywhere between one to three grams or none. So a vegan is not getting any dietary creatine. Uh, those that are on a carnivore diet might be all, all the way up to about three grams. And we excrete uh, through the urine uh, a product called creatinine in about two. So when you do the math, we're in a net surplus anywhere between one to two grams a day. And we know it's not essential because vegans can live a long, healthy, successful life. But we consider it conditionally essential because when we see all the evidence, I think there's over a thousand peer-reviewed papers, when we take in a little bit more, there is some substantial beneficial effects across the whole board, not just muscle. We're now looking at bone, brain, and the immune system.